stability in the storm. Now, for you personally, you might be contending with a storm right now. It could be with your finances or your health or your job or your boss, in your singleness, a relationship that's skewed off course. Maybe it's in your marriage or your children or, or a loved one that is weathering through a storm and you're just sharing all the emotions and the feelings. You're right in the very epicenter of that storm. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're having a wonderful, beautiful week. And I don't want to speak death upon that, but the reality is all of us know that we'll face problems and difficulties and struggles and storms and battles. That's just part of life. That's the clearest indication that you are alive. Jesus said, in the world you'll have tribulation, you'll have a storm, but be of good cheer. I've overcome that storm, and if you walk with me and are engaged in a living, ongoing relationship with me, I'll give you the strength and the tenacious spirit and heart and attitude to navigate through that storm successfully, no matter what it might be. Is it with your children, your grandchildren? What might it be in your life? Or maybe it is just the reality of God wanting to prepare all of us for what I believe is a pending storm about to hit America and this world. I believe that God wants us to be ready. He wants to give us a great stability, a footing under our feet that will undergird us, support us, and lift us up and maintain our strength to carry on, fulfill our destiny, and advance forward. So the question that should press in your mind and mine as well is, what produces that stability? We all are cognizant to the fact that we're in the midst of a storm or maybe a storm that's yet to come or a bigger, broader storm that's about to descend in judgment upon this world. How might I walk with a stable heart? Where does stability come from? I think there's a portion of Scripture that reveals it to us crystal clear. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 14. I'm just showing here two particular verses, verse 25 and 26, that speaks about Jesus walking on the water. I'll explain that in a moment. But first, let me just read the context of what was happening here in Matthew chapter 14 and verses 22 through 29. You're welcome to look at that in the Bible provided for you in the pew rec directly in front of you, your own personal Bible or electronic device. Go ahead, have at it. Find the Gospel of Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22 through 29. Now, what had just occurred contextually is that Jesus had pulled off an incredible miracle. The indication is that there were 5,000 fed. Understand the biblical writers would typically ignore the presence of women and children. That wasn't done in any kind of uh, discriminatory way. That was just simply the trend of the first century, and the biblical writers followed that. When identifying a crowd, they would number the men and not the women and the children. So we know it far exceeded the number 5,000. It was well in advance of 10,000 plus individuals that were miraculously fed by Christ. It's interesting that in that giving, receiving process that there were 12 baskets left over. I think Jesus made sure each of his apostles got an entire basket because they were an agent of giving. Each one of them, 12 baskets for all 12 apostles. Now, right on the heels of that, in verse 22, the scripture says, immediately, Jesus made his disciples. If you have your Bible, I would underline that, or at least hear the tone emphatically in my voice. He made the disciples get into the boat to go across. Now, no question, Jesus knows what they were about to face. A storm would befall them. Yet he, in the imperative mood, commands them, Get out on those waters. Interesting, isn't it? Jesus, who is and was omniscient, knew all things, even though he had limited some of that as he submitted to his heavenly Father functionally, but not positionally. He still was fully God. But he submitted himself to his heavenly Father, but he still knew he could have strong discernment and impressions of knowing what was about 
to descend on those disciples. Nevertheless, the scripture says immediately Jesus made. Again, he didn't suggest. He didn't invite them. He made them. Imperative mood, the mood of command. His disciples to get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. What a beautiful picture that Jesus, he sends his disciples on their way, but then he attends to those that had just been fed their belly was filled. They were surely content, but he still was there to graciously send them on their way. Thousands of people. And then after that, here's a key. When he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, I want you to remember that because prayer is probably one of the most beautiful expressions of surrender and submission. It's yielding your mind, your heart, your whole being to God. Jesus positions himself in absolute, complete surrender and submission as he comes to dialogue, to pray, to yield, and to surrender to his heavenly Father. Now, he is Almighty God. Again, as I noted, this is more a functional distinction. Theologians will call that an economic distinction. In other words, Jesus gave up the independent operation of his divine attributes as he submitted to his heavenly Father. But he submitted. God the Son submitted to God the Father. That submission is important because I believe that's the prerequisite to stability in your life and mine. Please don't miss that. God wrote this indelibly upon my heart to deliver to your heart. Surrender and submission, they are the prerequisite to finding stability in your life, to finding stability in my life. Jesus prayed. And then the scripture says, but all of a sudden it jumps from that very quiet scene where there was solitude and peace and solace of Jesus praying. All of a sudden, Matthew places the focus on another scene. That scene are the apostles in a boat contending with the wind and the waves and the water. If you look at the time scale here, they probably embarked on that journey at maybe sometime between 6 and 8 p.m. in the evening. And then the scripture says that Jesus doesn't go out there to attend to their need until probably 4 to 6 in the morning. That means they're battling that storm for 8 to 10 hours. It's a long haul. They're out there alone in the midst of a storm, battling. I've been on the Sea of Galilee. It technically is a lake, but it's large, it's broad. And there is the vulnerability of a sudden storm descending on that lake. The reason why is it's surrounded by mountains. So the warm air, the warm, moist air that rests upon the lake itself, then is invaded by the cold air and wind that descends from the mountains. And the connection of the two sometimes creates a very quick storm. When we actually went on the Sea of Galilee in the boat, but it was a large boat, a good, safe, big boat, it was calm, peaceful, beautiful, and then all of a sudden it started to get dark, and I thought, no, Lord, no, no, I want to read about this, but I don't want to experience it. <laughs> so thank God he answered that prayer, and it lifted, and that's when I engaged in a dialogue with our tour guide, and he said, oh, yeah, it can suddenly come upon these waters because of the mixture of air descending from the mountains. Well, the apostles experienced that. But the boat, verse 24, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea. Obviously, that's not where they wanted to be. They were probably toiling and struggling to advance their boat but couldn't do it with the crashing of the waves and the wind that was pounding against it. For the wind was contrary. Do you remember that word contrary? Because when you talk about stability and the prerequisite being submission, you know the battleground is going to be the area of rebellion. Rebellion. Yes, rebellion. When we reject God's authority in our life, we may do it in a very sophisticated, docile fashion, but you and I know the areas where we ignore or resist or literally rebel against God's will and His ways. And I believe that the Lord is saying to us as his children 
There can be no pockets of rebellion or resistance in our hearts, especially at a season, at a time when there's going to be such a spirit of rebellion unleashed upon this earth. We have to be the very antithesis of that. We have to have a heart that is surrendered and submitted and yielded to Almighty God. Oh, yes, we would be foolish not to conclude that there is massive rebellion manifesting in the world. But it will only increase more intensely. And it may seem logical, reasonable, analytical, but nevertheless... It's hearts and minds and thought patterns and philosophy and schools of thought that are at variance with God's will and his ways and his word. And God wants to fill your being and mind with a heart of surrender and submission unto him, realizing that's not an invitation to tyranny because he's a benevolent father that wants you to fulfill your destiny. He's given you a personality. He's given you passion. He's given you a skill set, and he wants you to use every talent and ability for his glory. But you've got to come under him. A yielding, a surrender, a submission brings stability under your feet. But resistance... Ignoring, rebelling, it'll be sand under your feet. Not the stability of a rock that God will provide. Well, the sea was moving rapidly. Jesus comes, verse 25. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. The disciples saw him walking on the sea. They were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. He was walking on the sea on the lake, on the sea. and They became fearful. And then he speaks a word to them. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, be courageous, be brave. It's I. Now I'm not coming with food. These aren't the baskets of the bread. It's me, just me. But I'm more than sufficient. My presence is enough to confront your battle and your storm. I'm coming right in the midst of it. Jesus said, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered and said, Lord, if it's you, command me. Here again. Interesting in the context. Jesus in prayer submitted himself to the Heavenly Father. Now Peter has the opportunity to bring stability under his feet in a very strange environment. Water. I want you to think of that. Think of what kind of foundation would you want to stand on that would produce stability and security? Would you, would you stand on uh, gravel or dirt or sand or quicksand? No. What if I invited you to stand on air? That'd be dangerous. Well, consider standing on water. Standing on water. How ridiculous. How ludicrous. How absurd. There's no stability on water. Hmm, I wonder what Jesus was saying to us that, by that miraculous act. Now, I don't succumb to the liberal theology of individuals like Boltmann who will say, oh, just look for the kerygma, the kernel of truth. This didn't actually happen. Jesus didn't actually walk on water. Absurd. Why don't you throw away the Bible and that God does supernatural things? No, Jesus literally walked on water, but he was communicating a very profound message to you and to me. You may have under your feet an environment that is very unstable. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's a relationship. It's your marriage. I don't know. But there's such insecurity because you're standing at something that maybe you would say, oh my goodness, my marriage, it's, it, it, it's not stable, it's not strong, there's no foundation. My parenting with my kids, there just doesn't seem to be anything under my feet but water. How could I possibly stand on water? But Jesus comes on the scene because he was submitted to God. And because he was submitted to God, that means God gripped him. God was holding him, holding him up, giving him a supernatural buoyancy that caused him to be above that water and not sink into it. So can I say to you, 
You might be in the midst of a situation that underneath your feet, there's no stability at all. There's no sense of security. You have a big question mark about your future, about that relationship or whatever it might be. If you say, God, though, I'm going to follow the pattern that Jesus did in prayer and Peter attempted to do when he said, issue a command so I have the opportunity to submit, to surrender, because I know that that will bring stability under my feet as I step on this water. Now, he may have not thought it through in such a sophisticated fashion. Maybe he was just desperate, realizing, I'm in a boat. My colleagues can't do anything about it, and it's going down. But he's walking on water, so I want to go to where he's at. Maybe this wasn't a big display of faith as much as running away from a descending boat. But he was coming under a command. There was that principle. It, this passage is, is pregnant with that principle of submission brings stability. Even if you're walking on water. Even if you're walking on a situation that there is no stability. Watch the moment you place your life in God's hand pulls you up. And the law of gravity won't apply. Jesus walking on water, unstable environment. My grandchild, I don't know where she's at, where he's at with God. My health, I don't know where it's going. This financial situation, my job, that relationship with my boss, my, my future, my education, this area in my life. This battle in my mind with depression, in my soul with stress and anxiety. It's like water under my feet. What am I supposed to do, Pastor? Surrender. Submit to God. Come under His authority, His sovereignty, His providence, His lordship. And watch the buoyancy, watch the miracle occur. You'll rise above that. Is it still there? Yes, it is. You don't negate it, ignore it, suppress it, or pretend it doesn't exist, but you apply a higher principle, like a plane taking off. It doesn't deny the law of gravity. It applies the law of lift and thrust, and it takes off. So let the Lord. But your requirement, my requirement, is... As you see here, it's not a loss of physical weight. Jesus didn't suddenly drop to feather weight. It was a loss of being controlled by natural circumstances. Maybe that applies to us. Saying, Lord, I'm not going to be controlled by anything but your lordship. Not by the unfolding of circumstances and situations that create perplexity and confusion and fear and anxiety and stress in my life. No, no, no. I'm not going to allow these natural circumstances to speak or dominate or control me, your lordship, your presence is going to control me. You'll allow me to arise above it. There'll be a loss of being controlled by natural circumstances in my life. There's another picture given to us. It's still in the Gospel of Matthew. It's found in Matthew chapter 7, a familiar portion of Scripture where it says, therefore, when Jesus is speaking and delivering to us the parable Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, that's surrender, and does them, that's submission, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Are you seeing the principle here? Submission. Whoever hears my words and does them. In other words, whoever comes under my auspice, whoever comes under my jurisdiction, whoever comes under my governance, whoever comes under my lordship, my rule, when you hear and you do, I'll put rock underneath your feet. I will put rock underneath your feet. Come under him and a rock will be formed under you. Here's now a question for you personally that you need to reflect on that I've reflected on for several weeks. Is 
Or are there any areas in your life? It's rhetorical. I don't expect everyone to respond here. Of course, we won't. It would be a bit embarrassing. Any areas in you ignoring or resisting or rebelling against God's will? Ignoring might be a position of ignorance, and I don't say that in a condescending way. It's a, a lack of understanding or exposure. We know that doesn't fly in our society. A police officer comes up and says, you just broke the law, and you say, oh, I didn't know. There's no argument from not knowing. But God extends a level of grace to us and allows our lack of knowledge to be educated. Once we've achieved that, it's dangerous when you know to ignore. Ignore is as if God is standing here in front of me and his authority is before me and his commands are laid out and his promises. We're not to be intimidated by them. He gives them to us to help us. To, his, his commands come to protect us and his promises come to advance us to fulfill our destiny. And so you can welcome those. I welcome your commands that give me uh, protection. And I welcome your promises that give me direction for my life. But we might ignore certain commands. Look around. Or there might be maybe not the area of ignorance, but the area of immaturity where we, we aren't sure, so we kind of resist or push away. I don't know how that really applies to me, and I don't know if it is for me. And you you've kind of resist aspects of God's commands or his promises or his very authority over your life. The most dangerous position to be in is when you turn your back, you shoot that ball in the wrong direction. When you turn your back on God, it means that now you don't see him as an authority in your life. You don't hear him as an authority in your life. It's gone. I mean, I don't lessen the danger and the severity of any one of these categories. The ignoring, looking around, the resisting, kind of pushing that away. But the rebellion is to turn your back. We're living in a day and an hour where multitudes have turned their back on God and they're running from Him. We have to be of a different spirit. We have to be of a different heart. We have to be able to say, oh no, I'm not going to allow any congestion in my soul, any paralysis in my spirit, any indifference or passivity toward God and His authority in my life. I'm not going to allow myself to ignore things that He's been pressing or resist those things that he wants to hand me, or give my back to God as if he has no influence upon my life and his authority is optional. I believe God is expecting this of us. Now, there might be rebellion in your own heart. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, there is a battle. There's, there's that which is in us, our flesh, the sinful nature, that the scripture says it's contrary. Remember that it says the wind was contrary to the boat, pushing it off course. In Galatians 5, it says all of us, all of us contend with and we battle with that sinful nature, the flesh, that's basically in rebellion to the will and the ways of God. And maybe another lens to look at that is from Romans chapter 7. Galatians 5, Romans 7, both indicate there's a battle on the inside. There's a war that goes on on the inside of you and me that's contrary to the Spirit of God, contrary to the Word of God. It wants to rebel. So what do you do? Do you remain indifferent and passive? Do you try to establish your own lordship over it? You try to say, boy, this area of lying or cheating or anger or embitterment or lust, drinking, these addictions, these areas in my life, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get them suppressed and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to establish my dominion, my authority, my, my lordship over that to get it down. But I'll tell you, this is not an issue of willpower. It's an issue of an empowered will. It's saying, God, I can't do this. Submission is saying, I can't. You can help me to let you. I come to you for help. I surrender and submit to you. I bring this area of weakness and struggle, this area of compromise, this area of rebellion, ignoring, 
suppressing your will and your ways. I, I bring this area of resistance, this outright area where I turn my back on you when that temptation comes knocking at the door. I find myself going there. What area in your life might that be? Is it jealousy or envy or pride or arrogance or materialism? Is it bigotry or cheating or lying or lusting? That list can go on and on, but we all know what we have a propensity to, to yield to. And you might fight it with all that you can, but it pops up because your hands aren't strong enough. Your will isn't strong enough. That's why the Apostle Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. I've married myself to surrender and submission to him. I've yielded to him so that I can then stand strong in him and resist this area that always seems to get the better of me. So can I invite you to do something? Yes, it's quite simple, but it's extremely profound and it's so holy and sacred to surrender and submit to God, literally to fall prostrate before him because when you fall before the Lord, you then will stand strong in him. Romans 13 and verse 14 says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you're encased. His presence is there. You now become immovable. Prior to that, you're movable. Circumstances can push on you. Some temptation can push you right off course. You're movable. You're vulnerable, like all of us. But if you're found in him, you've put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So you, you have fallen before the Lord. You then can stand in him. Now you're standing in the one who is immovable, immutable. Nobody can dominate, manipulate, or push him off course. So even though it seems mystical, it isn't. Purpose in your heart to say, I will throw myself before you. Maybe some of you this afternoon when you go home or this evening, you may need to literally get all alone and say, God, I take this area in my heart. I know we're about to face such rebellion in our land and in the world, and I don't want any pocket of that in me. So I bring this area of resistance and this area of ignoring and this area of rebellion, and I fall prostrate. Do it literally. I've done that. Fall prostrate before God and say, I'm acknowledging by falling prostrate before you that I surrender and I submit to your lordship, not mine, your strength, not mine, your ability, not mine, because I'm inadequate, incapable of pulling this off in my own power. And I'll be careful to give you the honor and the glory and the praise for the victory that is wrought because it was of you, in you, through you, and by you, because I can do all things through Christ. Who strengthens me. That's not the humanist manifesto. That's the Christian manifesto. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am in you because I have fallen before you. You purpose to do that in your heart. God will give you tremendous victory over rebellion in your own life. There's also the issue of rebellion that might come from the outside against you. God wants you to learn the principle that's taught by Moses when he had to defeat rebellion by, again, that principle of submission to God. Number 16 says a, 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 a revolution, basically, rose up against Moses. And here was Moses and his response. The scripture says in number 16 and verse 4, when Moses heard this, he fell face down. Here again. The principle of dealing with rebellion on the inside or rebellion coming on the outside or rebellion in the world. All three categories. The solution, the remedy is surrender and submission. It seems like the antithesis. It seems like it's a polar opposite. It doesn't seem like the right path to take. Imagine that picture in number 16. Korah, who's part of the tribe of Levi, steps up with arrogance and says... You think you're the big shot, Moses. Who appointed you anyway? 
We are all part of this universal priesthood. And we can do what the priests are doing. See, even though he was from the tribe of Levi, every priest has to be part of the tribe of Levi. But not every Levite is a priest. You had to come from the line of Aaron. And so he was arrogantly doing this and, and spewing out his insubordination, his insurrection, his rebellion. Here's Moses. Here's his response. Are you ready? Says nothing. Korah's before him, and he falls down. What kind of posture is that? What kind of strength does that exhibit? The big, strong man of God contends with this direct assault of rebellion by falling down? What was he doing? Succumbing and surrendering to Korah? By no means! He was making an open declaration of the position of his heart. I am here only because I have surrendered and submitted myself fully and completely to Almighty God. I'll deal with rebellion through the strength and the power of submission. Because when he got back up, he was in God. And he had the strength to deal with that rebellion. Many time rebellion surfaces. It may start this way, horizontally, interpersonally. But the devil always has his way of getting under there, pushing it right up. God. That's why it's so important. Parents, teach your children in a spirit of love and gentleness, understanding, but teach them the principle of surrender and submission to authority. Oh, I know there's biblical precedent for the fact, like Daniel or Peter, that when it came to the issue of an authority that was inviting you to do something illegal, immoral, unethical, or unbiblical, you had to divorce yourself from that. If there's a wife here and your husband says, now you submit to me. I want you to go out and function like a prostitute to make money. You don't have to submit to that. And you have the stand on what occurred in the book of Acts with Peter and in the book of Daniel with Daniel. Because you're being invited to do something that's illegal, immoral, unethical, and unbiblical. And you're to divorce yourself from that. I understand that. There's an aspect of authority that God places over you. There has to be that heart that says, Lord, I submit to you. And we walk in that heart and attitude of submission unto him. In closing, think of the relationship of Jesus with his father when he was about to deal with the rebel, the devil himself, and rebellion that was spewed out across the land. How did Jesus deal with contending with rebellion in his very face? The scripture says, in Matthew 26, verse 39, Jesus fell with his face to the ground and prayed, not as I will, but as you will. What do you feel pulsating there? Submission. Submission. And in submitting to his heavenly father, it gave him the strength to stand against the rebel and all that rebellion and to dominate and to win and to be strong. And I encourage you, if it's rebellion on the inside of your own heart, if it's rebellion that may be coming against you because of your position of authority, if it's rebellion that you feel every time you step into the world, it's all over. Your ability to gain victory over rebellion and to bring stability under your feet is a place of submission and surrender. Yes, it is. You'll stand up then with that great strength. Here's the prophetic word that God gave to me in this message. If you fall before me in submission, you will stand in me with great strength to defeat rebellion. Be that rebellion in yourself, on the outside, or in the world. God will give you that strength. Let's stand together. And I'm going to ask all of us, as an altar response, stay right where you're at, but in your heart, would you purpose to say, God, I lay prostrate before you with my heart. Would you close your eyes, young and old, those who know the Lord, those who don't know the Lord, I encourage you right now, here's your moment to say, God, I give to you my life. 
I don't just give you my sins to receive forgiveness. I give you my life to welcome your lordship. But for all of us, I invite you to do something that I know God is doing as another means by which to make us ready and prepared for what is about to be unleashed. That we would walk with hearts that are surrendered and submitted to Him. Every area, the areas where you feel confident and strong and proud and willing to tell others about, the areas that you wish you could hide, bury, and push in a closet, and just the mere remembrance brings embarrassment to you. Bring every area, every area. Say, I bring it all under your Lordship. If Jesus and Moses could fall prostrate, face down, how much more? Each of us. Say, Almighty God, I surrender and submit to your lordship. To you is the king over my life. Every dream, aspiration, desire, struggle, battle, weakness, and strength descend over me. When I fall before you, then I'm able to stand in you with a strength and a stability that you will supply. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now I pray this blessing over your life every single one of you that has surrendered and submitted to what God is speaking right now to you I pray the blessing that underneath your feet will not be sand but the solid rock the stability that God will bless you with now no matter if you're standing on water God will place rock underneath your feet as you surrender and submit to Him. That God would bless you with power to overcome all rebellion in you and others through your submission unto Him. I pray this blessing on your life in Jesus' name name. You've received the word of the Lord. Would you say, I receive this? God bless you. I love you. I give you a hug if I could, every one of you. I missed you with everything in me.